Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome to the Islamic Advice Podcast. I'm your host, Majid. And today I have with me my co hosts, Brother Rash and Brother JK. Assalamu alaikum, brothers, and welcome to the show. Wa alaikum assalam. I hope you guys, you guys are well. Good, alhamdulillah. Yeah, not bad. How are you? Yeah, all good, bro. Alhamdulillah, man. Um, just want to throw out there that uh, alhamdulillah, that this is the uh, 50th episode on the oh, Islamic sure. Vibes podcast. So, you know, alhamdulillah, we've hit a bit of a milestone there. Oh, oh yeah, 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 that's a bit of a surprise. Yeah, actually, I didn't realize we've done that many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, 50 <laughs> probably doesn't sound too much, but when you when you know what's been, what you put yeah. into it, it's uh it's, it's it's quite it's quite you know it's quite substantial to be honest it's with still you. an achievement i think you've done some without us as well haven't you you've done some with um like what's the islamic history podcast and stuff like that haven't you yeah 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 that's right so i mean as is the 50th you know throw a bit of a plug in that it's worth checking out some of the previous episodes um obviously with the usual brothers Rasha and jk um then also recorded a podcast with uh, a couple actually with uh, the uh, brother mutaki ismail from the uh, Islamic History Podcast. And um, I'm Dr. sure I recorded... Yuk- Dr. Yakub. Dr. Yakub, yeah, yeah. Um, some brilliant yeah. ones on, with him. Uh, did one uh, on the Ottoman history. Um, and also in Ramadan, did one with him as well in yeah. regards to uh, why history is important, Islamic history for Muslims. So there's been a lot of episodes, man. Alhamdulillah. And Alhamdulillah. Uh, hopefully people have benefited from them. And inshallah ta'ala, you know, we will continue going strong. And uh, hopefully uh, bring more benefit to others, but also, more importantly, benefit to our souls. And uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept the, uh, the effort I mean. um, that we place. And, you know, uh, inshallah ta'ala, be uh, in our advantage on the day of judgment when that's what matters, really. Yeah, I mean, I mean. No yeah. So inshallah, let's get into the, uh, the topics, uh, guys. So the first topic to discuss really is... Um, the issue of of the floods in Pakistan, you know, uh, I know there were floods in uh, Bangladesh not long ago. Actually, I, I know we, we we mentioned it, we touched upon it in one of the podcasts. Uh, Rush, you may recall, but it was it was a, um, I think it was just a mention, but yeah. I think that uh, the the scale of the uh, of the floods are you know different because what it seems is if you're looking at what's happening in Pakistan right now, mm. there's talks of I think. One third of the the country, I think, is underwater. Um, the sort of areas of that's underwater is uh, larger than uh, the size of the uh, of United Kingdom. And we've seen, you know, I mean, the stats are the stats say that a thousand people have died, but you know, I, I'm sure, I'm sure I've seen hundreds of videos it's going to be much more than that it's i think they already said it's been 1600 but that's just the official numbers imagine the part of people who have just got stranded and then just not been found mm. and stuff yeah yeah 100 percent, man 100 percent. i mean the thing about the people who you know the, the poor people you know in places like pakistan unfortunately they, you know their, their number really is like yeah, you yeah. know who knows who's been swept away and who who hasn't and i, I saw this uh this video where it was sad uh, and but at the same time, you know, it, it 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 was like Subhanallah, where there was this this child, baby, newborn baby was found, and actually had the umbilical cord still connected to her, which what I'm thinking is that the you know the the mother was swept away, gave birth to the child, um, and obviously you know the water took her in one direction, and the child was you know, uh, pushed into one direction. And, and you know, there's, there's probably a good chance that the, the mother hasn't survived. But mm. think about it, in the flood, right, you found, they found a baby who was alive, right? And it just goes to show that, subhanAllah, you know, when your, your ajal is fixed, mm. that, you know, you can even be a newborn baby, which is probably at its most vulnerable as a human being, yeah, right? As the most vulnerable for everything. For everything, you know, like nowadays people think that they're independent and stuff like this, and you know they can do. You know, a newborn baby is dependent one hundred percent, right? However, it was alive, and and the thing is, is obviously, you know, it's um, it's something which is is really sad when you see humans, especially your own, you know, Muslim people suffer like this. But 
I was thinking that there's also a different angle to this as well. There's obviously the kind of emotional humanitarian angle, right? But I think also there's uh, an issue where you could argue it's a political uh, angle. Mm. And I kind of throw in there, throw it in there. And obviously, you know, you can, you can give your thoughts generally on, on the, on the floods and maybe, you know, uh, address some of the, the, the points I'm going to make. Cause there was one video I was watching and uh, there was a guy who um, he was showing a video of, I think it was uh, Tariq Jamil. You know, Tariq Jamil is quite a famous uh, s- speaker. Yeah. Who was talking about, uh, I think it was like some hadith to do with, uh, you know, the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, for people sinning and, and so on. And, you know, we've come across these many times, right? But what this guy was saying is, he was saying, look, yeah, fair enough. There's these hadiths there. However, can you totally ignore the negligence of, of humans? Mm. And what I mean by that is, if you look at Pakistan and the, the, the situation there, right? They're talking about $10 billion damage so far. But actually, if you look at it closely and you think, yeah, look, the flood is, is obviously from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially with the way it's come about, right? However, could the people in Pakistan, could those in authority have done things better to actually, you know, limit the damage or prevent it, right? And one of the big things that I've come across is why Pakistan haven't built, you know, dams, why there are hotels and homes built in areas where, you know, it's known that flood water is going to go through there. Mm. I mean, I was watching this one video where there was this guy and he was taking, he was actually addressing the Pakistan floods and he was saying like, this used to happen quite frequently in like places like in Western America, in places like Seattle, Portland, Sacramento, right? And what he was saying is that they would get flooded quite a lot. And mm. then the Americans, they start building dams. And actually what happened was that this developed um, loads of things. They developed their way of their, stand, their standard of living, you know, it protected the uh, the food and so on and so forth, right? So some, some societies even utilize the floods that they know are going to happen to store the water and then reuse it again productively. So, you know, if you're properly prepared for these types of things, and no doubt natural disasters, you know, you can't truly be fully prepared for them. But some societies and systems are there in place that you can set your structure civilization and infrastructure up where you actually utilize the water that comes down from the mountains and the way it happens and all of those things of course because when you when you have i mean in 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 america for example it helped with industrialization because when mm. you've got that water that's stored yeah they use that okay because exactly. obviously we know with dams and stuff you know it, it helps towards the electricity and and all this sort of stuff right so so I mean that that's the angle that I, w- I was thinking about, where a lot of people yeah. are speaking about generally the you know the 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 catastrophe that's happened. But I think that you know maybe you look a bit deeper and think, wait a minute, why is it that in the Muslim lands where it's resource rich, right? People, you know, these things that which people are calling out and saying, listen, if you just had dams, mm. right, you wouldn't have this issue. And in fact, Pakistan has dams. And one analyst was saying that this has probably limited the problem, limited the 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 actual fallout because they do have some dams, right? Mm. But this, I think, to be honest with you, I think it's it's important to discuss the negligence and also the human factor of of what's happening, where it's not affecting those people who are at the top, those yeah. people who are rinsing the system, and it just affects the normal people. Um, Rush, what's your thoughts on generally on, on the flood and, and maybe on, on what I've said? Yeah, no, I have definitely got some thoughts on that. Firstly, though, have, have any of your family been affected and stuff? Do you know of many people? No, not, not 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 the moment, but there are rumours that the, the water is heading towards like uh, the Kashmir sides. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I don't know, man. But at the moment, it's it's uh, Karachi is being hit hard yeah. and ma- main, mainly Pakistan as yeah. in like the Pakistan side. But uh, Alhamdulillah, at the moment, the, the fa- family's been okay. Unless there's some family that I don't know who you know lives in Pakistan yeah, who's yeah, been affected, yeah. but, no, but no. Nah, not, not at the moment, bro. 
Alhamdulillah. No, a lot of people have been affected. And it's right to say that, you know, you do need to focus on the humanitarian thing initially, because like you say, the first and foremost priority is to make sure the help goes out to the people that you push the governments to react. That's first and foremost at the time when it happens. But, you know, what's really frustrating is when you do all that focusing on those elements, which, again, I'm saying you need to, after a while, the, the underlying reasons, like you said, some of the political reasons for why these things are allowed to happen, easily get brushed under the carpet. Or yeah. even if they don't get brushed under the carpet, it becomes like, you know, we saw it in other countries as well, where a, a tragedy of some sort happens. Everybody's focused on sorting out the effects of it. Then there's some kind of policy or report or, you know, years and years go past of the reports of how to improve this, this and this. You know, Glen, uh, um, what's it called? Glenfield, was it? Grand, Grand Tower. Grandfell Tower, as well yeah. as um, the dodgy dossier and all of these things. I'm not, I know they're not talking about national natural disasters, but things happen. There's an uproar. They go away and do some kind of uh, investigation, but people get tired of how long they take to do these things. And then they never get around to actually implementing the, the solutions to them. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why it's important to focus on both. It's important to focus on the reaction to the, the, catastrophe but it's also important to highlight immediately the reasons why these things are happening so one point I wanted to make really is that you get some people say that don't politicize this yeah when something happens and I, I kind of see why they say that because in the world we live in today when you politicize something you're usually attacking one party versus the other so like when something happens and people start attacking Tories in the UK, it's like, look, this is a wider problem than the Tories, let's solve the problem. But, and I agree in that instance, attacking just the Tories or attacking the party that's in leadership in Pakistan or in Bangladesh, when the floods happen there, that is politicizing it in a way where it's nigh on useless. Because mm -hmm. what you're doing is you're politicizing it to kind of say, oh, if our party was in charge, these problems wouldn't happen. The party that's in charge, let's blame them to bring them down. That's worthless. And that is, I would agree with someone if they said that to me, that don't politicize it. If that's what they mean by politicizing, don't politicize it because yeah. it's a waste of time. But when we say, or when when I'm saying it, and when you said, it, I think what you mean by the political side is, we're talking about politicizing in a way where you're looking for solutions from politics and from the way that regardless of who's in charge, you put infrastructure in place that prevents these things. And yes, you can't prevent a natural disaster, but like you said, you can definitely mitigate the effects of them. Yeah. So just in general knowledge, we know that you can have there's things that, Pakistan, for instance, Pakistan, you know probably better than me, Maj, about was it in 2010, they had similar floods, similar areas, um, sim probably slightly, well, probably similar number of people um, pronounced dead in terms of that unknown, but I suspect even then it was more, and even today it's going to be more than what they're publicising. Um, and that was in 2010, and then there was a repeat in 11 and 12, I think, maybe not as bad, but it, it happened back then. And there was lots of reports and stuff and investigations done then to put in place measures to improve the situation. And what people are saying, and again, I might be ignorant on this, a lot of those measures have not been put in place. You know, things like early warning systems to let people know that, you know, it's going to happen, you know, it's it's happened in this region, let other people in another region know so they can get out. You know, yeah. it won't mitigate the de destruction, but it will save lives. Mm. You know, these are not difficult things to do, but they cost money, no doubt. Um, you know, better housing, better standards, infrastructure. And you said, you know, about in America, the example you gave, it's a good one because they have storage facilities for flood water. Yeah. Yeah. And the, what happens is the flood still happens. You can't completely stop that. OK, you can put dams and things in. But then that water that does flood, they, they store it and they use it later. After the heat that we've had this year and Pakistan, I think, was recorded as the country with the highest daily temperature in the world, something over 50 degrees or something like that. They knew that there's going to be you know, they had really warm summer and the droughts and stuff. They knew there was going to be 
probably a worse monsoon season than there's ever been. Where was the preparation? Yeah. So I think these are the things I've got other points to make, but I want you guys to jump in. But the, these are the things that we do need to politicize. We need to talk about the things that should be done, the things that have been suggested, and then discuss why they haven't been done, because there are numerous reasons. Um, and yeah, my initial thoughts are we should be politicizing it, because we should talk about the fact that these things, whilst you can't stop the natural disaster, you can certainly stop, the, um, you can control the effects of it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, no, exactly. And and Jackie, just, just before I come to you, bro, one, one thing I want to mention as well is built on what Rush is saying is when, when we're talking about politicizing or when I mentioned politics at the beginning, politics is governing the affairs of people. And that's why we, we brought this up because it's not an issue of how many people die. It's not an issue of what you can avoid. However, you have a responsibility to govern and manage people's affairs. It could well be that you put all the measures in still the same amount of people die yeah. that's not yeah. the point that's not yeah. the point. point it's about responsibilities right exactly so i just want to get that in but jp yeah, yeah go for it bro yeah no i, I was going to make a similar point I, I don't think like you like rush said it's not about um say one party is better than the other or more prepared than the other i think one the context that you have pakistan in at the moment has been a lot of political strife political conflict obviously recently imran khan was ousted he got arrested there's, a, there's been a lot of um you know the rival factions, the rival parties are. There's a lot of politics going on. To be to be honest, it always is in Pakistan, but recently there's been quite a bit. And even with this incident here, you've seen both parties blame. The blame game has started in terms of the ruling party wasn't in power, so they couldn't have done anything. So blame is with the Imam Khan's party and all of that, right? So I think generally you get this uh, polit politicizing, as you mentioned. But the point here is not actually when we're not blaming. It's not a part about parties here. It's it's about the fact that they're leaders of the Muslim world land. That they're, they're leaders of Muslims, the leader of people, right? And as you said, Maj, they've got a responsibility to to make sure they're prepared. Uh, and when things like this happen, they react as well properly. Yeah. Um, the thing is, uh, it is difficult to prepare for things like this. So what I what I read is that um, some of the worst hit provinces um, had four hundred percent more rainfall than expected. Um, but Pakistan is known to get monsoon rainfalls. They have cycles of monsoon rainfall. So they, they, know, they know that things like this can happen. When it's going to happen, how it's going to happen, obviously that's very difficult to predict and it's not in their control. That, you know, that's from, from Allah, like, like we said. So it's not fully in their control, but there's things they can do. So, so as Rash said in 2010, um, they, they had floods and, and the, the outfall of that was... They need to better prepare. They need to make sure um, things are put in place and implemented so that they, when things like this happen again, the impact is minimised. And the point I'm making here is that I, th I think countries like Pakistan in the Muslim lands especially, um, the leaders and the, uh, the people that are ruling uh, over the people, they're, they're not in it to take, like you said, take, a care, take care of the affairs of the people. They're in it to really benefit themselves. So any investment that's required often partially is made, but most of it is pocketed um, by all. You know, this is I'm not blaming any specific party. Nearly every party in places like Pakistan, in Bangladesh and other countries uh, across the world, to be fair. And I don't want to just limit it to the Muslim lands, even in even in the Western lands, this happens to an extent where um, politics has become a dirty word because actually the politicians just look to gain it from it themselves rather than really doing what they're meant to be doing, which is mm. to look after the affairs of the people and, and help them. And I think, yes, now there will be some sort of reaction. They will you know, have to invest in terms of the reacting and getting people out of um, the situation to safety. Uh, but it's too late. It's too late. And I think that's what we need to reflect on. Yes, help the people. So do, do, you know, raising money for them and, and, and sending temporary support is obviously going to help the people there. The sad reality is that even the you know the numbers about one thousand being killed, that will even grow, even if people don't die as a direct result of it. Indirectly, mm. you know, whole farms have been destroyed, yeah. their livelihood has been destroyed, their homes have been destroyed. You know, your basic essential needs as a human being has have been destroyed for many many families, hundreds of thousands probably. You know, so. And that, for many years, not just it's not yeah, for many years, yeah. So the impact of that 
will ha- will be greater actually the, in terms of the scale the scale will be greater and people will die as a result indirectly from this this uh, this catastrophe um so the numbers don't really um stack up it's not like western lands where actually they can be brought to safety and and, and they're protected and there's not nothing like that to be honest they're just going to be on the side of when they say safety they'll just be mm. on land where there's no f- rain um but in terms of them feeding themselves and having shelter lack of due to the lack of it they'll probably die so i i, I think we can we can talk about that and and obviously there is a humanitarian reaction that has to happen um there's been some i've seen some um articles and some news talking about how if you compare it to like the uk or other lands in the half of the uk would be it, that that's the same scale as how much pakistan's been affected so that's it's all of uk it's all of uk Wow. Yeah, it's growing all the time. That it's, it's, early on, it was like a sixth of Pakistan, wasn't it? But it's just been it's just increased. growing. Yeah. So, yeah. so that shows in itself that you know, uh, is there a world reaction even as great if if this happened to the UK, for example? Mm-hmm. You know, and that's something else altogether. But yeah, I think we need to reflect on things like this. And yeah, it's easy, easy. I'm not saying we point fingers and stuff, but we should look at it holistically, not just the humanitarian side. We should also put our hands up and say, okay, what could be done better? To avoid things like this because we're accountable people will be responsible for things like this yeah the thing is i mean i, I didn't even think about the the world reaction in all honesty i mean when when remember when that that church or cathedral or something got yeah. burnt in france mm, yeah yeah quickly they raises millions of dollars right yeah, but the thing right. is look with pakistan the situation isn't great there anyway right yeah. and you look at now uh they in they're talking about 10 billion dollars um damage right Ooh. um sorry just, no. just if if you want to do a bit of research just just have a look at how much pakistan paid the imf back yeah yeah exactly. right how many billions how much billions of debt it's in mm. right it's it, it actually seems like a situation where it's going to be impossible right to get out of it yeah there, so there's going to have to be wholesale changes there's going to be wholesale change. And, and we need to look at, you know, from an Islamic point of view, if you, if you look at in the past where there were like, you know, you could call them uh, um, catastrophes in places like uh, in places like the Hijaz, when there was a famine at the time of uh, Omar al-Yananho, you know, how did he deal with that situation? And how many people did, well, did he bring into Medina and make sure that were clothed, that were fed, right? And here, people will be talking about a primitive 7th century society. Mm. But you know what? A, it wasn't primitive anyway, but what were they doing? He was managing the affairs of the people because he was responsible over them. Yeah. Right? And in the situation of the Muslim world today, forget about the uh, in the non-Muslim world. I mean, like you said, it's a good point to, to point out, JK, that we always kind of think these things happen in the Muslim lands only, that uh, all the developing countries. That's not the case, right? Mm. But let's just talk about Muslim lands. It's all about it's about responsibility, and it's certainly in places like Pakistan, those leaders are so out of touch with mm. their people, mm. right? Since its creation, that all they've ever done is fill their pockets. Yeah. Well, many leaders are profiting from these things as well. So back in the 2010 um flood and things like that, what you had is obviously there was a lot of foreign aid, there was a lot of other, you know, help come from, coming from externally. But you know what? Even rebuilding the infrastructure that's destroyed, you know, like hundreds of bridges got destroyed, yeah, maybe more, yeah. So what happens is those people in powerful positions or in leadership positions and governmental positions, they subsequently actually profit from rebuilding that because what they do is yeah, then they yes. they get more projects. Contracts, they yeah. get projects for rebuilding and we saw we saw it in obviously Syria and some places like that where the West want to send their contractors in because they're thinking let's destroy the place by via war and then let's be the first ones that get all the contracts to rebuild the country it's like a win-win for them but sadly some of the Muslim leaders are doing this for themselves they're going okay we'll we'll be inadequate and maybe inadequate is putting it kindly but we'll be bad leaders we won't provide the people with the services and the facilities that they need we will be you know we'll consume the wealth that comes into the country and that leads to negligence and in poor infrastructure. And then when that infrastructure falls apart, 
be it normally overuse or be it natural disasters, they then get the contract to rebuild the infrastructure. The whole system is completely broken. And then you get all the corruption that comes into these things as well. You know, we can speak coming from Bangladesh and things. A lot of the times, a lot of the projects that some external countries don't want to invest in in places like Bangladesh sometimes because they go, well, when we come in and give you the money to do something, you keep half of the money that disappears to into certain bank accounts and you use half the money to do a half half baked job of something. So then the likes of China and stuff nowadays you could go, no. We're going to bring our people and our money and our designers and everybody, and we're going to do it for you. We're not going to give you the money to do it. Yeah? And they do, bro. And they, and they, they do. I mean, I've seen Chinese people in, building bridges in Pakistan. Exactly. And we know that China are also doing it for their benefit. Again, don't. it's not like they're giving handouts. No, not at all. But it just highlights the corruption that's there. And then that leads us also on to your point about the IMF. I, I think that's a good one to mention because um, the IMF, I think th they've set up something called a, a Resilience and Sustainability Trust. Yeah. And that's for countries that are suffering from climate change related disasters. And therefore, this is a, a climate change related financing project or trust. But you know how it sounds nice, doesn't it? It sounds like, oh, OK, when countries suffer from, you know, natural disasters, here's the the, you know, the IMF coming along with their bags of money. Here you go. Here's some money for you to um, sort your problems out. But we know what the IMF does afterwards. We know they put like adjustment policies and stuff on countries to implement certain things, implement be it like democratic practices, implement certain policies that are capitalist Western style policies. And on top of that, the interest payments are what kill some of these countries. So back in 2010, when the flood happened, the, uh, the some of the advice was they need to spend more than 10 billion to put all of this flood defenses and disaster recovery in. Hmm. And then the argument was 10 billion is like more than a quarter of the annual budget of the budget Pakistan even has to, you know, that it um, collects in taxes and stuff yeah and might even be more than that yeah so it was like they couldn't afford to do it so you could say it's easy for you to sit there and go oh you just spend on flood defenses we can't afford to spend on flood defenses but if you're paying like half of your annual taxes and budgets towards debt repayments and interest repayments to these western nations who are profiting off the natural disasters that are happening are profiting off you know these things that are happening then you're always going to be in that situation you're always and they they're abusing it they recognize these countries are poor they're never going to fully be able to set up their infrastructures and therefore will help them but in helping them in the same way as a bank when it helps you yeah when a bank gives you a loan okay fine you can't get that money together. So going, you feel the bank is helping you, but the bank doesn't do it without any benefit to itself. The same as these, you know, the World Bank, the IMF and all of these, they're doing it because it benefits them. And not only financially, but because they can then push certain policies onto those countries, it, it benefits the, the hierarchy and the status quo of, you know, a, a America being the the sole superpower, the dollar being the um, the sole you know the the currency that everybody's using and things like that. So it's much more dangerous than people really appreciate, and that's why our countries are in these situations. Yeah, yeah, of course, bro, of course. And and just to add to that, if you look at you look at Pakistan, and I remember there was a time when Pakistan was kind of like neck to neck with India. You know, mm. currency wise, um, and as as a power, I would I would say I can remember that time. But India's gone in one direction, and Pakistan the op in the opposite direction. And actually, if you look at it from Pakistan's point of view, whether Pakistani nationalists like this or not, is you know it's it's a puppet state. Uh, its uh, military is an extension of you know uh, of what America's agenda is in the area. And its politicians are, are corrupt and just puppets. But if you think about it, yes, we've got this flood issue at the moment. But have people thought about the damage the war the the war on terror did to Pakistan? 
Mm. And what was it doing? It was just obeying the commands of its master in the in Washington, right? And actually, you see a big turn in the directions between India and places like Pakistan during this time, where you know Pakistan was fighting its own people in a way, right? For this, and what did it get at the end of the day? It got nothing, mm. it, you know, from the Americans for this. Uh, the, the Americans have always questioned Pakistan's intentions its loyalty, whilst at the same time it's rewarded places like India, right? It's rubbed the 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 dirt to it rubbed Pakistan's nose in the dirt over and over again. And now, to be honest with you, we're looking at all these issues and this dysfunctional society and corruption from the top to the bottom. And when I say to the bottom, I'm not I'm not basically having to go at the people. What you gotta understand is when the society only works in a corrupt yeah. way. It's a good point. The, the, the normal people can't go about. It's like uh, if you give, if I give you a, or a, an example, you go to some of these like places in in the Muslim lands where I remember in in like just say in Saudi where these uh, you have these little booths where you change your currency, right? And if you ever go to one of these, if you've got long arms, you're at an advantage, mm-hmm. right? Because there's no queuing system. It's a case of just putting your arm forward and, you know, the guy notices you, makes eye contact and gives you your currency transfer, right? However, if you went there and stood in a line at the back, mate, you're not getting served. You're never getting to the front, yeah. <laughs> right, you're not. And someone from here may look at that, oh, look at these uncivilized people. But that's just the way it works there, right? Because you ain't going to get served by standing in a queue in the same way the people who do things on the ground, a lot of the times, is not because of, the bad people is because that's just the way the system is. Mm-hmm. I mean, right now you're definitely gonna have some people who are hoarding and 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 you know, and increasing the prices extortionately. But you have do have some people who have been affected by the supply chain of of resources of tomatoes and onions and stuff, who may have to hike up the prices. But there's definitely people who are taking taking advantage of this situation because. Their, their reference point may be something which is a benefit. And one quick example I want to mention is a brother was telling me this, that there was a time when, uh, I think it was around the time of this this famine that happened in, uh, in the Hejaz, where there were people who, I'm sure it was salt, they were they, they were they had the prices extortionate mm-hmm. because there was a, a shortage and they were hoarding it. So what Omar Adelano did, he went... Out of the, he went to an like external supplier, whatever you want to call it, brought loads of salt, brought it into the market and started selling it at its proper price because those guys were taking advantage. Mm-hmm. But the point is, is Swan may be doing it uh, with ill intentions. Otherwise, other people may be doing it because that's just the way it is. But when you have a system from the top to the bottom where corruption is spread, you have the leaders who have towed the American line Right, not our choice is because they have to, because it's a puppet state. And now that you have all these issues, now it's in trillions of dollars or trillions of Pakistani rupees in debt. Right, one has to ask themselves, how does Pakistan get out of this issue? Mm. And it's not going to be by taking more loans from the IMF. Mm. There has to be a radical change. From the level of thinking, from the from the on the societal level, on the people level, in the ruling, and the rulers, and this means going back to Islam, implementing the Sharia, managing people's affairs based on the divine system that's been that was revealed to our Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's no other ways about it, and I'm not saying that this is a you know this is an overnight thing. Or it's like a, a flick of a switch. I'm not saying that. However, it's it has to be something that we need to talk about. We can keep sending money. We can keep sending money, right? Some of it might get there. Some of it might not. But as you guys have pointed out before, it happened in 2010. It's going to happen again. They're talking about the glaciers. Pakistan as a country in the whole entire world has the most glaciers. Mm. And they're melting. This is going to happen. But then you need to think about it. How is this going to be addressed, right? But I don't know what the solution is. But one thing I do know, and is a fact, is that as Muslims, we need to be referring back to the Quran and Sunnah for the solutions of our problems. And this is a problem. How do we deal with these issues? How do we minimize it, etc., whatever? 
Well, even if even if it's like glaciers and stuff like that, remember, you know, even a lot of the places like the Indus River where people are building their houses and stuff like that, you know, if the government wasn't corrupt, if the people were getting housing, remember, this is a duty of an Islamic state is to make sure your people have housing, you know, they have somewhere to live. Yeah. So what's happening today is that, you know, the houses and stuff that people are even building there. They're only having to build there because they haven't got any land because all of the, you know, the people who are more wealth have got all the land. So they're forced into building in places where they probably shouldn't even be building their floodplains. And then there's difficulty because of that. The government isn't keeping up its responsibility of making sure it's housing its people. So you have this, you know, it's like um, it's double whammy, you know, whatever every side is an issue you know where you're living the lack of wealth the government not doing its job it's everything's the worst it can possibly be so you it results in this and what you're saying is if it's done properly then the borders are a problem remember because what you have is you might have pakistan which has got its borders or you might have some places where imagine there's somewhere in the world where it's difficult to live there anyway and then you've got these borders around you that you can't build outside of because they're the borders of your country and things like that. Really, if the borders of the Muslim world came down like they should be, you know, the Muslim world's borders should only be on the outside, you know, Darul Islam, Darul Kufr, yeah, there should be those borders, yeah. Then if there's those issues, then there's look at all of that land there is to live on to farm on to build on to make sure that the resources that maybe say pakistan might struggle with a certain resource allah has given us so much resource across our land that if we help region to region then we can live in comfort because the land is there the resources is there the wealth is there everything is there that our yearning to defend islam if we build our level of taqwa and build our level of understanding of Islam, that's there as well. And it's not even pretty words because we saw it. History testifies to it. So it's not even about saying, oh, yeah, yeah, that sounds fanciful. If we can testify the fact that it happened in history for over a thousand years, then why can't it happen again? And that's where we, those problems we need to discuss them. Otherwise, it always will be, oh, if you're politicizing, you're just talking party politics. It's not party politics. It's about a political solution to a political problem that faces the entire ummah. Yeah. The, the, the other angle that I was looking at as well is if you take a back step from all of this, what you know, why, why are these floods happening to such an extent so yeah. frequently mm. in the world today? Like, obviously, just had one in Bangladesh, in Pakistan's getting more frequent. All around the world, there's natural disasters happening. Um, and it's actually the okay, look, we can't control when they happen. I'm not saying we, you know, you can prevent them, but you know, we have to take some level of accountability when it comes to um, the environmental impact the world is having, having in terms of climate change. So, you know, you're talking about the glaciers uh, melting in Pakistan. Actually, that what's that as, as a result of? It's, it's the fact that there's a greater extent of greenhouse gases being, um, you know, uh, let out into the environment. Not just by Pakistan, but the, the Western world mainly, actually. They are the, the biggest contributors uh, and some of the developing, when I say developing, your, your Indias and Chinas of the world, uh, those, those rapidly developing countries, they are the, the, the main uh, contributors to greenhouse gases being set out in the environment. So that has an impact on on your melting glaciers, um, on rainfall, the whole cycle is linked, isn't it? Mm. So it's not just a case of, yes, it's just happened or, you know, I know, I understand that it does happen and it's unpredictable, but there's, you have to just take a step back and ask ourselves, why is this happening? And it's mm. a result of capitalism. The fact that um, the, 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 the world today is dominated by a system that seeks to over, um, you know, over accelerate its production. And the, and the sole purpose of the capitalist economic system is to maximize production, GDP, gross domestic product. Um, and they will do anything to achieve that because the whole purpose, and, and you go back to the, the, the reference point, is about benefit. Mm. So if you look at the Western nations, they will think about how do we um, basically produce as much as we can, right? So uh, these industries, and, and the, when they went through the Industrial Revolution, the countries like Pakistan, China, Bangladesh, they go through their own level of industrial uh, revolution, or not revolution, but industrial progression. 
um, which is causing more impact on the environment, which is leading to things like this, right? Yeah. Whereas what what Islam, the way a Muslim and Islam should view this, or Islam does view this, is that in fact it's not about maximizing production; it's about sustainable growth. It's not that you can't produce and can't grow; you can. But actually, it's not about these capitalists getting filthy rich, having that much land as Rashford was speaking about. You know, there is land available in Pakistan. It's just that it belongs to the few and the capitalists, right? It doesn't belong to the masses. Um, so the masses get left with these uh, end of the end of the uh, you know borders, end of near, near the rivers and stuff like that, so that they're at more risk. But in a a real leader would be thinking about the people and making sure that their basic needs are met, as an Islamic state would do, actually. And Omar did when he was in power, and all the other Khulafa that were there. Omar bin Abdul Aziz is a good example as well. He eradicated poverty in, in during his reign. So. The point here I'm making is that we need to ask ourselves, are the leaders playing their role? Um, are we questioning the way the world is moving in terms of capitalism and the fact that capitalism is dominating and it's having the ramifications can be seen quite clearly now, you know? And the sad thing is the people that get most affected are, are Muslims, actually, the Muslim lands, because they're being governed by corrupt leaders who don't have one inch of, you know, you know, uh, you know, sympathy or empathy for the people whereas at least in these nations in the western nations yes they're corrupt and they do think about their back pockets there's some level of actually thinking about okay you know they have their brownfield sites and things like this there, there is some organization you could call it level of organization in in our lands in bangladesh in particular and pakistan there's no organization you kind of just everyone's just left to their own whims the the capitalists and the you know the elite are getting filthy rich uh, and the people uh, in the end suffer from things like this yeah no bro that's i think that's a fantastic point you know we can't uh not factor in the role of uh capitalism and the role of this ideology um but remember even allah subhanahu wa tells us in the quran that you know if 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 allah had uh, made revelation based on whims and desires of man then the whole world and everything surrounding it would come to destruction and and this is what we're saying and, and the arrogance of these people are that they're destroying the land the, the the earth the world they're living in and they're targeting the next planet to go and destroy yeah right you know what wait a minute why don't you just start looking after the the earth that you're living on yeah you understand yeah. and yeah. it's and that's the thing from allah's part from an islamic point of view even something as you know uh basic as our body this belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whilst we have it, it's a trust. We use it in the same way the resources, the same way the earth, right, isn't there to maximize profit, is there to, to live, to enjoy it, but with the purpose of linking it to your, your uh, reason of existence, which is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. So your, your, you know, your agenda isn't to just maximize you know, benefits at the expense of of everything and anything. I mean, there's, I read somewhere where when the, uh, I think it was the Spanish, when they went to South America and the amount of population that died, that had a, an effect on the climate, climate right? Yeah. Looking look into it, but it's, it's, it's shocking. I mean, this is not Muslim uh, reports. This is like, you know, scientists uh, who have, have studied this and said, you know, the amount of people that died in South America due to colonialism, right? was had an impact on the on the uh on the, on the world on the climate you look at i think there's something like how many football size uh parts of uh the amazon football pitcher size parts of the amazon is uh cut down every day mm -hmm. again you look at the world and subhanallah the intelligent architecture behind it how you know the how all all of these factors play into may give life to this earth to make sure there's enough oxygen and etc all this you know it's a perfect design but now when you put the limited mind of man and you now throw in greed you now throw in jealousy and all the you know these other traits that humans have and you base a system on that and then all you see is that there's a section of the society which profits and the majority of it is going to be at loss 
Mm. And the point you're making is a good one where you look at the capitalist ideology and where it's implemented, it's in the West. However, who's taking the who's you know taking the brunt of the 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 issues, the problems to do with the climate? It's in the Muslim lands. So, uh, yeah. so yeah, guys, uh, the, there was an, another uh, story that you know we all, I wanted to speak about, and time is kind of ticking. But if you guys got anything more to uh, add about the story, go ahead, inshallah, and uh, you know, and we'll we'll take it from there and it see see how it go with time and stuff. The the only other thing I was going to add is you know, um, Rush made the point about um, like the IMF um, loans that Pakistan are taking, um, as well as foreign aid. So you know, for, I did uh, my dissertation on foreign aid and and whether it has a positive impact on sub-Saharan African countries to make it it was a specific dissertation but the the point is actually it, it doesn't it benefits the donor sorry benefits yeah the, the one who's giving rather than the, the receiving nation more because actually the, the aid is not aid when we think of aid we think it's like free handouts right it's not actually it's it's linked to um they get a return because like Rash said they don't no one does it for free the capitalist nations are not just going to give free money out to an extent yes yeah, minimal but really, they're looking for some sort of return. Um, so the the point I was making, going to make, is that linked to this point about capitalism, a lot of the foreign aid, IMF loans, these the adjustment policies that are linked to these are about really accelerating the nation's growth, so that the 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 one who's donated uh, the the aid, uh, the, the Western nations essentially, they can gain from it. They can gain the product from it. They can gain exports. They can. Uh, their investment there's a return on investment right they'll look at it like this they won't view it as a humanitarian issue they will view it as a return on investment how much are we getting how do we maximize that return on investment because they think of it as a business as a capitalist um, transaction so even here where there's foreign aid provided or imf loans provided the what the nation receiving it needs to do is purely think about how they're going to uh, implement policies that will drain their resources. Really, there's no sustainable. There's no sustainable growth here. This is about draining their resources, so that the donating nation essentially maximizes, and and, and the West maximizes their profits and their wealth at the expense of the the nation. And they, Pakistan's one example. All the other nations that receive IMF loans, very uh, wasn't, similar. Wasn't it? Oxfam did a, a study many years ago. Yeah, I think yeah, now yeah, it's yeah. gone Oxfam, quiet yeah. now. Oxfam did a yeah. study on Africa. The fact that Africa was the most densely re- resource yeah. um, heavy Rich. continent on earth. Yet, if you did the the maths between how much is taken out of Africa yeah. and into Western and Eastern lands in terms of natural resources because of some of their projects there versus the aid that's provided, the graph is just like insanely. Yeah in favor of the donor and you know but then what happens is the media plays a role the media publishes all of the figures about oh look this country is given two billion this country is given one billion whatever but never highlights how much of the natural resources are are being taken and to give you a more recent example look at what's happening in Yemen so now they're having their fuel crisis and now they're worried about oh rising prices of of, um, for the consumer as well as for some of these industrial companies that they're going into our lands and setting up projects to take our gas yeah, yeah? Exactly. and you know and why are they doing it because they realize oh they messed up or their prices are going up and they're struggling somewhat and now you know who are the ones that are going to suffer again are the muslims in the countries they've already destroyed via instigating war and using their weaponry in order to profit in the arms industry it's just like every yeah. single channel tentacle. for them it's a tentacle. Yeah, every tentacle yeah. every channel for them is about you know, even if we make a mistake, will the the people at the bottom of the food chain will use them to yeah. recover anything that we do lose? That's why they have no they they have no real care for the yeah. the common person. And, and the thing is, they don't care about their own people, let mm. alone people from other nations. You know, we there's a topic we probably could cover in a, a future podcast, but with the whole cost of living crisis, it proves that they don't care about their own people. So mm. why would they care about people in Pakistan or Africa? They don't, oh, Yemen, they don't yeah. care. They don't care. So yeah, I just thought it's, it's worth highlighting the fact that aid is not aid in, that, in, the, in the, the way we'd define aid. It's actually investment, you could call it, yeah. probably a better definition. Yeah, of course, bro. Of course. And I think that's really important. And it's really good that you touched upon about that because what they do, like Rash said, is, you know, they, they will uh, really 
get their PR spin on it that you know the, the, this which is being sent and some people might think actually why is it all being sent by, by the West why is all Muslim countries not sending any aid but the reality is this is not handouts and uh, in fact with the IMF the re the the repayments you know when they're structured this involves reform it involves yeah. reforming the system education system, education all system yeah. and all of this right and um well, even what it's called, International Monetary Fund. It's, forget international. This, these are controlled by the superpowers. Yeah, forget yeah. your International Monetary Fund. It's, okay. it's bogus, man. And, and most people aren't even aware of how these things... Oh, I, I think more and more people are becoming aware of it. But, you know, it feels like, okay, we well, can't change that. So let, let's not talk about it. But think about it, though, Rush. You know, even with these loans that are given out, right? Bro, they just numbers binary code they just they're, they're printing the money printing the money but what are they yeah. getting actually in return yeah. real tangible resources Resource. yeah that's yeah. mad yeah 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 and we're seeing that from the likes of saudi and stuff aren't we it's absolutely insane you lot are giving away your resources for bloody paper money that these lot are printing you know at every opportunity because everything's linked back to the dollar come on man yeah yeah uh, and maybe another twi- um, another podcast on petrodollars and stuff like that at some point, maybe in the future. Yeah, yeah, I um, think it's important, bro. I think, but I think that that point, just people should just think about it. That you know, the, the IMF will give these loans, and the resources. I mean, like you guys have mentioned, you know, in in Africa, the amount of resources that go out, if they were now used in um, Africa itself for the betterment of the the people. If there was, you know, it, certainly in the Islamic part, if the rulers were implementing Islam, where in Islam we know that the, the raw materials, you know, like your salt and, and like your oil and all this, the gas, this belongs to the Ummah. Yeah. This is the wealth of the Ummah. If you could understand that, bro, Africa, when we just think about Africa, we think about poor people in Ethiopia. Africa no, would be running the show. Running it. Well, you know, I, I'm glad you give them more example of Africa because you know the likes of, you know, these Western countries are racist, yeah? Because they previously always looked at, oh, they still looked down at black people, yeah? But there was a time when they thought, you know what, these lot, we're more educated than them. We know better than them. Therefore, we'll go in and we'll rape and pillage them literally yeah but you know as the academic side of things increased in the likes of africa because we know that human beings black white whatever color they all have a capability to be able to be the most intellectual person in the world it's nothing to do with color but now that the african countries some of them have you know much more acad- you know academics and much more people who can solve these problems what do they do they cause rifts between people cause wars in those countries you know be it the christians and the muslims be it all of the the conflicts that are happening there because they're clever they're what they're doing is they're going yes we raped and pillaged them before when we perhaps had better infrastructure and we were able to do it now that they're capable of solving some of these problems for themselves let's cause conflict in those areas so they never have that stability to be able to go you know what we want to do a lot of this ourselves because even like extracting oil and gas and stuff they talk about needing some of these major international players to do it yeah but the, the Muslims and the Africans and people in those countries, they're more than capable of doing it if you gave them the opportunity to be able to live their lives and, and progress as a civilization the way you guys have ha- had the opportunity to do. Bro, how many Nigerian brothers we met? Amazing. Very, very intelligent, right? But when mm-hmm. you think about Nigeria, you just think about like some phone scammers. <laughs> yeah, that's, and that's, the, that's what they try to get into your yeah. psyche, yeah. yeah you understand exactly. that these people are just criminals and they just do fraud, right? You know what? Some of the most intelligent people I've met have been Nigerian. You know, yeah, so. amazing. So it's again, this is it. They they push the race card, you know, under 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 the underground or like yeah. without blatantly saying it. And it's it's horrific, man. Mm. Bro, just uh, I just want to. It's, it actually probably deserves a podcast in itself. But if you if you uh, read the speech by uh, Muhammad Mahathir, oh yeah, yeah about yeah. how the west they just love war mm, they just yeah. love killing yeah you know and uh colonialism and, and throughout their history but when you control the media 
the narrative is completely different. Yeah. It seems like the bloodthirsty people are elsewhere. Mm. And the, the people who go to the aid of people, whether it's wars or whether it's, you know, natural disasters, it seems that we're like the West. And I remember in the past where Muslims have said, well, well, look, when st- things happen, like the, the earthquake happened in Pakistan or where things happen elsewhere in the Muslim lands, you don't see the Muslims going to uh, these countries and uh, sending aid and stuff like that. And I hope if people have that view and are listening to this podcast that, you know, with the stuff that you guys have talked about, is that removes that notion that these people are doing it for any humanitarian reason. Yeah. They're doing it because it's just going to maximize profit. So it basically, the phrase that they say, say, you know, the English phrase that, you know, kicking someone when they're down. Here, in most in most cases, they actually throw the person down and then kick him. But sometimes when they're not actually involved in it directly, they still kick him in the teeth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's just their... I'm, I wasn't going to say fitra, but that's not the case. That's just their way of thinking. It's their worldview. It's the ideology. It's the ideology. And it's something which is in total opposite to the, uh, uh, the ideology of Islam and the way Muslims think. Yeah, so that's the problem. With, sorry, just a very, very quick one. The problem we're going to have is natural disasters are going to increase now because of climate change. Natural disasters are going to increase. So the likes of the IMF resilience and sustainability trust and stuff, very clever, isn't it? Because they know that natural disasters are going to increase. They know that there's third world countries or countries that are cannot sustain even quite rich countries are struggling now because of the cost of living crisis you know countries that were doing well economically bangladesh was one of the best growing economies in the in the in asia yet but they're struggling now they're really struggling now because of the cost of imports yeah? yeah, massively struggling. So um, these kind of trusts that the West set up in dollars again, remember, these things are going to come to their benefit because our countries and the third world countries are going to suddenly go, you know what, we need to get money from this trust because this trust has been specifically set up because of natural disasters. What does that do? It then puts that dependency, that massive dependency of our nations, of of the Middle Eastern Muslim nations, African nations, it puts their dependency back onto the superpowers. And this is a way for them to keep dominating the world. And this is, like you said, colonialism. This is the neo-colonialism. This is the new colonialism of today. And it's all down to tentacles of of the dollar and tentacles of of finance. Well, ju- just one example t- for that, bro, is whilst the world is struggling, the dollar is getting stronger yeah. and stronger. So I mean, that should put things into perspective. But guys, what, what we're gonna do is, inshallah, we did have a, a, another topic to discuss. The topic of Shamima Begum, I think, is a really good one. But I think what we'll do is probably save that for uh, another episode uh, because I think I don't really want to dilute. The content that you guys have uh, brought forward for this particular podcast is really important, inshallah. So, what I want to do is probably get get you, uh, some of your final thoughts on this the topic of uh, Pakistan, the floods, um, and what's happening, and and maybe what what we should expect and how to change it, etc. But uh, J.K. inshallah, I'll start off with you, bro. If you wanted to give me your final thoughts yeah. on this topic. Yeah, I think we've discussed uh, much of what I wanted to say and what you guys have said as well. Really. really good discussion i think um final thoughts really just to reiterate that yes it's a humanitarian issue and it's a, a catastrophe that we can't control and it's, it's from allah um and and look we we should be helping where we can in terms of donating and you know the, the fact is though we probably even how despite how much we donate it's not going to be enough actually and that's another thing to think about we can do our bit definitely give, give as much as we can but this is something that will requires multi million, multi millions to be fair, maybe even billions, 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 really. billions, billions. billions um, to solve in terms of uh, the actual disaster management, so that things like this, when it when they do happen, there's a, a good reaction and um, death death and destruction is minimised. Um, but we can do our bit. But I think the the key message really is that even after doing that, we should be looking at the deeper issues here about what's how what you know what's how it's been caused how we've really maximized by not doing enough mm. the impact of things like this and not just from a management from the country so pakistan and the government definitely look at that um, that's really important and 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 step away from this kind of 
as Rash mentioned, politicking about siding with one person over another. Really just ask ourselves what should be done. What would the messenger system do? What would the real Islamic leaders do in this situation? And set that as your ben- as the benchmark of what we should expect from any leader. That's the, the first thing. But also, I think it's also um, worth looking at the ill effects of capitalism and really questioning that looking. Do, you know, I haven't really given many figures, but it's worth researching the impact of um, the, the you know, capitalist nations are having on climate change and the greenhouse gases that are emitted into the environment how that's had an impact on not just Pakistan, but recent disasters. I think that's quite big for me. That's a really big issue that we should be unpicking so that we can really, when we're speaking to other Muslims and others, really basically destroy this concept of capitalism and this ideology because it's destroying the humanity. Not forget the nation of Pakistan. It's destroying humanity um, from all levels, the values that it teaches, the reference point in terms of um, really maximizing on gross domestic product and benefit and everything. And, and we, we will be going towards that direction if we don't stand up and, and really hold it to account and seek an alternative system that will bring back stability. And we'll be able to react in a much better way to things like this than what we've seen, really. Because look, if you see some of the scenes, it's devastating. And I saw you know, some families really just trying to save their own children from the, the sway. It's, it's devastating. And it's like, subhanAllah, like, we'll be accountable for this. You know, Allah will ask, what did you do? This is not just Pakistan, but all these situations that are happening. So, you know, we do need to reflect on this. Um, like I said, I'm not taking away from helping help in the short term as much as you can. But think of it in the long term as well, what needs to happen mm. um, so that things like this are, are, are minimised. That's really my final thoughts. And Jazakallah her, bro. Jazakallah her. Um, Rush, any final thoughts, bro? Yeah, I, I think JK has covered it, so I'm not going to recover any of that. All I would say is we just need to move away from like a defeatist attitude to some of these things. So the natural tendency is, oh, it's a natural disaster. We can't do anything about it. So just help send money and stuff like that. That's a bit defeatist. What we need to do is, yes, we need to help, as JK said, wherever you can. If you've got family, if you can send money to them and help them and help them build their houses again. And no doubt we should be doing that. But to do that without also discussing what the correct solutions are, how we solve these issues would be the same as like, you know, in your house, you've got a a boiler breaking or whatever, or you've got a pipe leaking, constantly sticking a bucket under the pipe every time it leaks. You're going to, that means you're never looking at the root cause of the problem or, you know, if there's something wrong, look at the root cause, you know, and yeah, you can definitely mitigate the effects of these natural disasters. You can definitely mitigate them. And that might not even, you know, like, I think, I don't know if it was JK herself said earlier, yeah, the numbers of people still might be the same that die, but look under an Islamic way of thinking, you do your best and then you leave the rest in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We haven't done our best. We haven't done our best as leaders, as an ummah, as people, as, you know, we, we haven't done our best. So until we do our best, it's not okay just to go, oh, let's just leave it in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do leave it in his hands, but we have to do our best. And I think we have to discuss that as an ummah, be it here, wherever we're living. And that's why sometimes people go, oh yeah, you're living in the comforts. It's easy for you to say, you know, you're not the one who's trying to hold on to their child. But you know what? At the end of the day, are the things that we're speaking about to solve these problems not the correct solutions? So should it matter where you live? If you're talking about the correct solutions, if you're calling out the corruption, if you're calling out the systems, then that means you're identifying the problem and seeking a solution for it. It shouldn't matter where that voice comes from. And sometimes it takes someone from the outside to see the problem on the inside. It's very hard, like the corruption angle earlier. When you're in the bubble of corruption, you're going to pay the the bribe to the, to the officer to get you... F- past that location you're going to be involved in the corruption even if you don't want to be because you're in that bubble sometimes it takes someone outside the bubble to look in and go look this is the solution and i think we need to be involved in that discussion just off the head bro uh, some solid points and the only thing i'd like to add is the fact that for some some reason we always when there's uh a calamity like this a natural disaster um some people always naturally tend to lead towards the people being punished. And and what I would say is, look, we don't know whether it's a punishment 
because it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we do know is it's a test, okay? And it's not just the people uh, that are affected directly that are tested. As an ummah, we are tested. And yes, uh, as the yeah. brothers have uh, you know, emphasized, we should help out every, anyway, every, every way possible. But it's important that that assistance cannot be devoid of discussing the solution. It can't be. If it is, then you're not helping the situation. You may be, you know, getting, you may be helping someone have some food on a particular day, but these days will come again and again and again. So when we're talking about the test, there's a test for everyone. And just by sending money, I don't think that's, you know, you've done your bit. I think we need to do what we can in the short term. However, we need to discuss the long term. And if it means discussing politics, then, then, then it has to be done. There's this mindset of don't speak about politics when you speak about Islam or like Rashid said earlier, don't make this into a, a political issue. However, reality is, is that the, the, the solution for the floods in Pakistan is a political solution. Those $10 billion that are that damage that's been done, it's not going to be recovered by people sending over what they can. Right, it needs states to deal with it. This is a state problem, right? It's not something that the normal people can do. So, if we do our bit, we should then put the expectation on those people who have the capacity to do it and say, Why are you not doing it? and they will know the reason why they're not doing it is they're just filling their pockets. We need to replace these people with people who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and look to the solutions from the Quran and the Sunnah. And do it for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not to build mansions and to buy big homes in London, in you know, central London and stuff. So inshallah, guys, let's um, end it on that point. Uh Jazakallah khair for coming on and uh, expressing your thoughts, which really important thoughts you you know, points you've made. And uh, I'm sure this benefit the uh, benefited those listening and watching. And the only thing I would say is that the brothers have really just touched up on a touched up on a few things, touched on a few things. Sorry, um, it requires us to go into the looking into the stats and the figures, and everything is there. Everything is there. When you start delving into these facts and figures, you will see actually the problem is completely different than what you were thinking. Mm -hmm. So uh, on that note, my brothers, Jazakallah khair, and Inshallah Taala. I will see you on the next one. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.